serve as project and team lead a scientist at BeautyCore, uh, a company that uh, focuses on gene uh, therapy development located in the uh, Netherlands. Um, Dr. Anga uh, was uh, previously worked as a viral uh, vector scientist at uh, Cervec Pharmaceutical, and he also did a two years uh, postdoc uh, at a research uh, institute in Germany uh, called uh, Greencore. And uh, he's uh, an accomplished uh, scientist where he has uh, published uh, numerous uh, high impact uh, vector uh, journal and also have uh, two patent uh, pending. So uh, Dr. Anga will give a 40-minute uh, uh, talk, then there will be a 15-minute uh, Q&A uh, session. And I would like to re uh, remind the audience uh, to mute your uh, speaker during the uh, talk. And in the Q&A uh, session, the attendees may uh, unmute the uh, mic, or uh, you can ask questions via the uh, chat box. So at the um, end of the uh, power talk, I would like you uh, to ask the attendees to uh, fill in um, evaluation survey uh, to give a feedback to our um, event. So uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Anga to uh, start his uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Anga, you may share your screen. Um, thank you very much. Do you guys hear me? Hello. Yes. Uh, can you speak uh, louder because your voice is uh, still? Yeah, I think I think because I'm sitting outside because uh, my daughter is sleeping inside. <laughs> Sorry. So, do you guys hear me? Hello. Yes. Is it a lot clearer right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what should I do right now? I guess I'm just gonna share my screen. Hmm. I never thought that it's gonna be this formal. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Do you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Where should I begin? Okay. So yeah, uh, thank you very much, Leoni. So for the kind introductions, uh, my name is Anga. I'm currently working as a team lead scientist in uh, Unicure. Uh, so, um, Unicure is an AAV gene therapy company. Uh, it's, a, it's a company that was founded like almost, I think, 30, 20 years ago. Uh, it was founded in the Netherlands. And then after that, um, uh, the company spread a little bit. And then we tried to recoup the US market. And then we went public in 2014. And mm, we opened our manufacturing facility in Lexington, close to Boston area. And that's where we have uh, the biggest uh, manufacturing capacities to produce AAV gene therapy. And that's also where uh, our sea levels are located. So the, uh, uh, the people who work in the Amsterdam's are mostly uh, people who work in the R&D side. So we are doing mostly R&D related stuff. The US is more like a GMP manufacturing. But before we get into details about that, so in this uh, in this opportunity, I would like to introduce two things about the AAV gene therapies, which already becomes a trend nowadays. Uh, it's uh, it's the new pharmaceuticals, and then uh, I would like to also introduce a little bit about my company. So, what is AAV gene therapy? AAV gene therapy is basically uh, it's a, it's it's also a kind of a viral vector. So it's made from an adeno-associated virus. Uh, so technically, in the past, uh, this virus was discovered like uh, almost like uh, 50 years ago as a contaminant for an adenovirus. So when you isolate adenoviruses, usually you always have like a little uh, contaminants. Of, um, and as you can see in these figures, um, you can see like the smaller, uh, small balls. Uh, it, it's basically, that's that's the AAV. Well, the bigger one is the, the bigger particles. This one is an adenovirus. In the past, people more uh, concerned about the adenovirus. First, because adenovirus is uh, one of the viruses was suspected to be an oncogenic virus. 
and second it was hit uh, it was uh, kind of famous in the, in the beginning of the 90s to be used as the agent for the gene therapy so to deliver uh, to deliver genes to, to the human but then at the end of the 90s which is uh, I think around 99 there is one patient die because of the adenovirus therapy so basically it just kind of like killed the whole gene therapy field until people discovered that hey we can use the, the sister of the adenovirus which is the adeno associated virus this virus is relatively smaller uh, and it's a it's a, basically it's a non-pathogenic virus and uh, what make it really great is actually it's a uh, it's a dependable virus so this virus cannot replicate without the help of the helper virus which is in this case is adenovirus that's why it's uh, called adeno associated virus <laughs> so the virus was technically discovered in 65 but people never really pay attention on it until roughly around the 80s but the 80s is like the blooming era for biotech industry and molecular biology anyway so everybody at the 80s will like trying to clone anything so any kind of viruses you you try to extract and then you try to clone it as well it also goes the same with like for example like i used to work with hepatitis c it was also around the 80s where people tried to clone it and really create a molecular clone so in the 80s it was firstly uh, uh clone <clears throat> and then proven to be like we can recreate the synthetic uh adenovirus make it replicate in cell culture and then uh in, so at the beginning of um we we, tr we start realizing that there is a potency on the there's a potential use of the adeno associated virus we can basically replace the genomic content of the adeno associated virus with the therapeutic gene what we want <clears throat> and then in the 2012 uh, my company basically the first one who filed for application for use for the adeno associated virus for a very ultra often ultra often rare disease called uh, LPL deficiencies and the first product for the uh, using AV it's called Glybera unfortunately this product was uh, withdrawn from the market because not because it's not functional it's 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 super functional but it just the market is not there because um, it's a uh, uh, it's a therapy for an ultra often rare disease which happens among like one every one million patients so technically the company cannot make money out of it and in order to maintain the license from FD from EMA the European medicine uh, medical agency uh, we keep we, we, we need to keep paying license and basically it's a cost so you know, if uh, we compare the cost and the benefits so it's better to withdraw because we cannot sell it anyway but in 2018 uh, there is another company uh, discover another uh, therapy it's called Luxturna which is also an AAV base it's to treat this therapy is to treat a, a rare disease but on uh, on ice so basically it's for treating blindness it's not full blindness but for partial blindness but in the 2019 there is one uh, really <coughs> really breakthrough like uh, this is the first time that AAV is being being used to treat uh, major indications relatively major indication which is to treat SMA the spinal muscular atrophy and uh, the company well technically it was founded by Apexis <coughs> and then it was licensed out to Novartis so uh, in this opportunity I would like to also share about the benefit of uh, you can see in this <coughs> Uh, interesting uh, do, you, do you guys still see, see my screen or am I hello Lenny hello yes we can see your screen do you, are you seeing my the YouTube that I'm sharing or are you seeing my slide uh, only the slides okay only the slides okay it seems that it doesn't work that way Sorry, um, I need to do this. So SMA is basically a disease, is a rare disease that affects a baby, uh, newborns especially. So the newborn that was born basically, it's, we call it as a floppy babies. So it, uh, it lacks an ability, the neuronal uh, 
the, uh, the muscle, the neuronal that control the muscles simply doesn't really grow because it's lacking one of the genes called, S, called SMN. And because of lacking of these crucial genes, the neuron basically doesn't grow. And so the muscle cannot really expand. Uh, so the baby usually um, pass away, uh, <clears throat> like the age of two years old or three years old. But then because of the AV gene therapy, we get a gene replacement, so it can get replaced. So the baby basically can survive. Um, I really want to share the, um, um, maybe it's better just to share the screen. Yeah. Um, are you seeing the, are you still seeing my slide or are you seeing my YouTube channel? Um, yes, you can see um, the YouTube okay. link. There's no sound though. Yeah, it's there is no sound, it's fine. I don't think you can share sound. Okay. So basically when the baby born, um the baby basically lacking of an SMN gene, so basically the baby becomes like a floppy baby, like I already mentioned it before. That's why the first baby die, and then this is an AV gene therapy. The virus basically infect the neuron cells, then deliver the missing genes, and then that's why the baby can grow right now. And this is basically, I mean, this baby usually it used to have two sister, and those two sister um, pass away because of you know you know the baby cannot grow because of. Uh, like you know, the gene, but right now she can grow because <clears throat> and because she got she got the gene replacement anyway. So right now she's already grown up and she's a healthy baby, and she's already a toddler. And yeah, basically right now she's like a normal baby. So I just want to share you this. It's gonna okay, and then let's go back to the presentations. Okay, so an AV gene therapy is based on an adenovirus virus. It's a small virus. It's only less than 5 kb. Um, so um, I don't want to get into details of the virology because it's not beneficial. So basically, it's a complex of two very important proteins for the virus replications, reps and the capsid. And the capsid is basically acting like a nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles, and it basically also what um, drives the AV to infect any uh, specific target cells and target genes, um, <coughs> especially target cells, sorry. And then depending on uh, what kind of serotypes, you can also kind of steer on what kind of uh, target cells that you want to infect with the AV. So the major AV serotypes are, the, there, are there are tons of AV serotypes, two, three, five, and six, and non-human serotypes. So uh, we, we get into that later on, what's the benefit of each ser different serotype. So for AAV, if it, if it carries its own uh, um, viral proteins, it becomes a virus. But when we replace those cassettes, the rep and cap with control element and terpic genes, it becomes a viral vectors. So yeah, this is basically the stuff that we use to deliver the missing genes to the SMA baby. SM uh, so what we did is like we replaced the terpic genes with the SMN gene. So, sorry, <coughs> I'm sitting in a balcony and it's so cold outside. So it's like five degrees. So I keep having a mucus 
Um, so uh, yeah, this is basically the serotype of the AAV. Um, so there are several different serotypes of AAV that, and in different serotypes, it has it means it has a different capsid. So by utilizing a different capsid, you can also target different uh, tissues in the human in the human bodies. For example, like the AV2 that is being used for in Apollo it's being used. Uh, it's mainly used for targeting eye, like uh, muscles. You can also use AV5 or uh, for heart, for example. Nowadays, people use AV9, and so on and so forth. And this is a kind of a, a, a clinical trials that are currently ongoing to assess the ability of uh, various different products using an AAV gene therapy base. So from various different indications, uh, from for example, like <clears throat> on eye diseases, there are tons of eye diseases, and uh, hemophilia A, hemophilia B, another kind of uh, neurospinal muscular diseases, like, like beside SMA, there is a, another disease called DMD, or Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And also there is, a, um, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, People use it also for San Filippo, but mainly uh, we use AAV as a gene therapy for uh, very rare diseases, like rare, really rare, sometimes ultra orphan disease. And here I would like to share on how we usually produce AAV. <clears throat> so AAV, uh, even in the, in the industrial scale, people use uh, transient transfection to produce AAV. And sometimes people also use baculovirus uh, to produce AAV. Um, this is just another brief uh, look on, uh, for example, on how we produce AAV using a mammalian system or using a human-based system. So uh, the virus itself can be cloned into a plasmid, plasmid DNA. And then the plasmid DNA can be transfected into a producer cells. In this case, it's a hex cell line or the human embryonic kidney cells. And then you know, using a triple transfections, it can produce an AAV that will bring the transgene, that bring the therapeutic values. So far, when people use a HEC-based system, people still use it using um, a roll bottle system or a cell stack. So our company uh, basically goes into another kind of method on how to produce AAV. We use an insect cell virus called baculovirus. <clears throat> so I, I don't know if you guys know what baculovirus is. So baculovirus is basically an insect specific virus that uh, people use it uh, to produce recombinant proteins. And for and in, in our case, we, we use it to produce the AV based gene therapy. So uh, the combination of a triple baculoviruses or a dual baculoviruses infect an insect cells it will produce AAV. So technically speaking we are using a virus which is an insect cell virus to produce to infect an insect cells to produce a human virus it's not technically a virus it's a viral vector human viral vector and for a therapeutic values for human beings so it's kind of complicated it's technology wise it's not very easy to understand. <clears throat> but the process is kind of similar like well, how we produce many different recombinant proteins. Like uh, it's, we expand the C trains and then we inoculate with the baculoviruses in the steel tank bioreactors, we lyse it, and the crude bulk will be clarified. And then we perform affinity chromatography and exchange nanofiltration in order to get rid of the viruses or remaining viruses uh, uh, and then final fil final filtrations and then we get the drug substrate the drug substrate is basically the one that we use for therapeutic functions so technically speaking uh, i just want to share that what i'm currently doing is like uh, maybe some people in the past thinking that it was only like a myth or uh, like a like a, <clears throat> like a feature actually the av gene therapy is here and we already uh, use it especially in the developed countries like in, um, like in Europe or in US people use it like a normal prescribed therapies 
and may, unfortunately, it's not unfortunately, it's um, the main indication that we are trying to aim right now is mostly are rare disease related because most of rare disease, re only uh, a gene associated diseases is, are mostly rare diseases. And then there, so the problem is um, nowadays, um, there are so many challenges to make AV target, uh, uh, not a small indication diseases, but we, uh, we also want to move it into a larger indications. But the problem is how we, the, we are still struggling for the dose, the efficiency, precision, high titer. And then the most crucial thing is the manufacturing, the ma manufacturabilities. So, <clears throat> so far the production is very, um, uh, is very, it's very costly. So that's why the price tag, for example, uh, the, the life-saving one, so Gesma is a $2 million therapy. Which is quite makes sense because uh, previously uh, for SMA there is no therapy at all, so the baby will eventually die anyway. But uh, with so Gensma because it's a life saving and it's technically a cure, and it's a one time infusion, so the price tag is roughly around two million dollar. It's quite justifiable, and it's also because I'm also in the industry, I kind of understand why the price tag is around that. It's it's very high. It's because of the, the materials, the technology, and all of the tools are currently still really expensive. And then here I would like to share a little bit about my company, Unicure. So Unicure is basically present in two different continents, the US and Europe. One is in Lexington, US, I already mentioned it before. Second is in Amsterdam. I'm, I'm currently working in the Amsterdam side. I cannot travel to the U.S. because of uh, the travel restrictions <laughs> and also because of Trump. And so uh, what we have in the U.S. is large-scale AV manufacturing. We have like 80,000 squ 80, square feet of uh, a hu huge sterile GMP facility to produce AV. <clears throat> and it's based on the insect cells and baculovirus system. We have 500 liter steel tank bioreactors to produce AV. And then, yeah, we have been producing some of our clinical grade materials there. And our proprietary technology is based on the AV5, which is a serotype 5. So we use everything using AV5 instead of using AV9 or AV2. Why we use AV5? Because AV5 is a long, yeah, we already invested a lot of money and time, not only money, money can be searched, but time is very important because you cannot really replace time and it's an accumulation of knowledge. Smart people are putting a lot of their effort experiences. And so it's a long-term follow-up. So we, we accumulate a lot of uh, understanding on AV5 and it's uh, basically um, the, the most efficient AV to counter against neutralizing antibodies. The reason why we concern so much about neutralizing antibodies is because every human being is basically already got infected by AEV. And we carry uh, some neutralizing, uh, some degree of titer of neutralizing antibodies in our blood anyway. So <clears throat> when, you inf uh, when you treat some patients that already has a neutralizing antibodies, your treatment becomes ineffective because your AV will be neutralized. But in the case of AV5, AV5 is, uh, the, the neutralizing an antibodies against AV5 is relatively less prevalent. And second is, even though that there is, uh, the neutralizing antibody is less uh, potent. So the AV can be, it's not neutralized, the antibody can, be, can bind to the AV, but it's not neutralizing. So it's binding, but not neutralizing. And it's less immunogenic. And so far we have, this is our pipeline. Our most advanced program is, uh, uh, we call it uh, Entranades, which is a therapy against hemophilia B, which is also a um, gene, uh, gene defect related disease. And the second most advanced is against a Huntington disease. So we cover two different parts, which is a liver directed diseases and also CNS directed diseases. Huntington, uh, we'll get into that later on. And several other programs are still preclinicals. 
And we also have a huge collaborations with BMS and CSL Barry. <coughs> we go with the Hemophilia B. Hemophilia B is basically one of um, uh, blood-related disease. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's cre it creates a clinical bur a burden. It's a lifelong bleeding risk. So people who have um, hemophilia B will need a constant uh, therapy uh, using an um, injection-based um, prevention or, or protein replacement therapy, uh, which is basically de facto nine for uh, or other kind of therapies. So <clears throat> it's very cumbersome, uh, cumbersome ter treatment with adherence qu uh, issues. Quality of it affects a lot the quality of life of the patients itself. And of course, it's painful. You get jab every three days, for example. It's like insulin. You get jab. You, you, you don't want to live that kind of life, technically. And it creates an economic burden. So for the replacement therapy, it's not cheap as well. It's, uh, it, it, it sounds cheaper than a $2 million therapy. But when you break it down into an annual amount, like how much you need to pay for every pence that you need to jab every three days, and then it becomes an accumulation. So, uh, so the number six hundred thousand US dollar is an annual cost for the factor nine replacement therapy, and you still need to get jab every three days, <clears throat> and it's a hard, and it's a lifelong. So, uh, even though there is not the patient who's going to pay those therapy by themselves but uh, it's gonna be the insurance. So it's, it creates a soci societal burden. So uh, there is a benefit for a, a, a gene replacement therapy against this kind of diseases. So uh, the key treatment features for the entrodentist is we need to show the ability to increase the factor nine activities into therapeutic level. Therapeutic level means so patients would have a normal not not necessarily to be have to be a normal amount of factor nine like a normal human being but it should be able to have enough so it doesn't really trigger you know spontaneous bleeding so no bleeding even post treatment no replacement therapy required outside of surgery no requirement of immunosuppressant uh, that's also important because you don't want to get uh, you know gene therapy replaced but on Okay, you don't need to get jab every three days, but you need to, you know, eat. Uh, you need to always consume uh, immunosuppressant pills every day. You don't want to do that. And then the most beneficial things of Unicure therapy is using the AV5. So technically, every patient that has a pre-existing neutralizing antibody that used to be, you know, uh, put away, right now can also be included. <clears throat> so the so this is one of the clinical data that we have. And this is using a, an old version of the Entradenis, which is the AMT-060, which is the, uh, the brother versions of it. So uh, this is the surveillance for almost two years study, more than, um, it's a four year studies. So using a four year studies, we could, uh, we could see that the significance, um, you know, we basically the patient get to replace, get that um, um, infected, not infected. Um, yeah, I think it's <coughs> being, uh, the, the factor nine gene is being replaced in the liver of the patients. And then we monitor that for four years and we can see that the, the, uh, it, uh, the factor nine level is stabilized and it's there, it's present for the durations of four years. Um, so basically, even though it's not 100%, but uh, factor nine activity is close to 10% means uh, almost like this, this, this patient basically can live like a normal life without getting jab for every three days. And this is the mo this is the data that we have so far with the upgraded versions of the AMT-060 called AMT-061. So this is the uh, our real product, the antagonist. <clears throat> and this is a one-year data. And we can see that after being injected, the level of the factor nine elevated, reaching almost forty-one percent of the normal. And then it constantly expressed in the liver, and then the patients uh, have a normal level. 
and it's already being observed roughly close to a year. And I think right now we are closing to two years observation. So basically the patients lives like a normal life. It's, they are no longer hemophilia patients. And right now we are, we already enrolled the phase three clinical trials using this therapy. We already uh, basically in, installed 54 patients and treated all of them. And right now, well, based on the PR that I observed, I received like a couple months ago, we basically already collected all of the data we just need to announce. So this, the phase three, client, phase three trial is the most crucial trial to really decide whether your product is really functional and whether you are allowed for uh, making a BLA uh, applications or uh, <clears throat> biological license, um, I forgot what is the, so basically it's a license that allows you to commercially sell the product. Um, we also have a product against a Huntington disease. Huntington disease is a um, neurodegenerative disease that affects, it's also, um, uh, an autosomal recessive, uh, autosomal dominant uh, 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 neurodegenerative disorder. Basically, is being passed down from one of your parents. So every um, um, this kind of this disease is simply kind of relatively being neglected because, especially in the developing countries, because the symptoms kind of look the same like a Parkinson disease or Alzheimer. But uh, if if, if the diagnostic is uh, there and it can be performed efficiently, people can know that okay, this person has Huntington, and Huntington is technically uh, in in the gene uh, that encodes a protein called Huntington. There is an expansion of a CAG triadenucleotide, which create an amyloid structure. So basically, it creates like a <clears throat> like it, mm, like a stress in the neuron, and the neuron will die. And because of the neuron die, uh, start dying, and you, the patients start losing a lot of uh, uh, neuronal cells, uh, the brain becomes less and less functional. That's why the manifestations, if people don't do a molecular diagnostic, they all look the same, Alzheimer, Parkinson's, and Huntington. They, they tend to look the same. So what we do is in using a, uh, uh, an AMP 130, yeah, we are using, uh, we call it um, a knockdown or a silencing platform. So it's a kind of vice versa against the intranetis. So what we, intranetis is we call it an augmented therapy. So we replace a missing gene, but with the AMT-130, what we do is like there are tons of these uh, uncorrected, uncorrect genes and accumulations of this toxic protein. So what we do is we knock it down, so we reduce this protein yeah, from the mRNA level. The problem is with the HTT or the Huntington, you cannot really knock it out, which is you really make it silent, totally silent, because the Huntington protein itself is important for the normal function of the neuron. So we, we need to tweak it, the, uh, the therapy, in order to like really reduce it to, a, to the level where the patients still can survive and really, you know, uh, enjoy the benefit of the therapy, but you know doesn't really destroy the function of the neuron itself. So we already tested it in a culture human neurons, rodent, and HP, and the pig, and it's uh, shown efficacious. We can reduce the uh, mRNA level and the protein level of the toxic uh, Huntington. And right now, it's already in the phase one, two clinical trial. <clears throat> So because the, uh, because the disease itself is pretty unique, so we cannot really treat some patient that already showing symptoms. Uh, so like, uh, it's because we already categorized it, it's too late because you, know, you won't be able to salvage these patients anymore. Um, so what we do is we treated patients that are healthy, but we already diagnosed this patient for having uh, this kind of mutation in the genes. So the clinical trial is pretty complicated. <clears throat> so I think um, uh, this is all that I would like to share about um, AV gene therapy and also about the company that I'm currently working in. So what we, what uh, the take home message is the AV gene therapy is already there and uh, the, the product is already there, lots of clinical trials, but the technology is still, be, is still relatively expensive and it's, uh, uh, it's very advanced. 
the biggest problem is right now uh, the, the the patient who can enjoy this kind of therapy are mostly located in the developed countries. Uh, uh, for people who live in the developing countries, that will be a challenge in the future. How to bring this kind of therapy, or what uh, what people usually suggest is who uh, a patient who can afford two million US dollar can also afford a ticket to the US to get to get uh, to get uh, traded in the US so but yeah it's really not ethical you know <clears throat> so I think that's all that I would like to share I hope that I don't really talk that much I'm sorry if I yeah I mean I'm not a lecturer <laughs> I'm just a scientist working in the industry so I'm not meant to be giving lectures so um, thank you very much for your attention if you have any questions uh, any curiosities feel free to throw me some questions whatever or whatever I give it back the floor to you, Leonie. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, uh, Anga, for your uh, presentation. That was uh, really insightful. So uh, I would like to invite the um, attendees to uh, ask a question. You can ask a question directly or uh, via the uh, chat box. So we have a question from uh, Christian uh, Hanbali. At what age hemophilia B gene therapy is most um, effective? Is there an age limit until hemophilia G gene, B gene therapy does not work? It's a, it's a very good question. Um, you don't want to treat uh, patients there are, because an AV gene therapy is mostly, especially AV5, mostly targeting the liver. And the younger the patients, uh, the liver usually is more active in, pro in proliferations. So you don't really want to treat patients who are, whose liver is not yet really mature because it's still proliferating and they are losing the benefit of the AV gene therapy. So actually there is no age limit, but there is, uh, there is no upper cap, but there is, a, you know, there, is a, there is a bottom cap. So you don't want to treat, for example, a 10 year, lower than 10 years old, you want to uh, treat patients who are uh, already in a teenager uh, age, so they can maximize, maximally really, you know, enjoy the benefit of AAV gene therapy. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I would like to invite uh, more question from the uh, audience. Okay, uh, perhaps I um, I have a question. Um, so how does the uh, viral vector work in our uh, body? Does the viral would only affect like a certain um, cells in the body or how, to, how does it work in um, the body itself? So it depends. Um, so the, uh, yeah, I'm only talking about the AV viral vectors. AV viral vectors mostly, it depends on what kind of serotype that you use. Like uh, AV5 mostly infected the the liver, so we deliver the gene, the missing genes to the liver. But we also uh, give, uh, for example, the like different serotype AV9. Uh, if you give it intravenously, the, it will also deliver to the CNS, so it can cross the blood brain, barrier, blood brain barriers. <clears throat> and then, yeah, um, it, and it's also depending on the administ administration route. For example. For our Huntington therapy, we give it directly intratecally. So technically, the patient has to be um, has to enjoy not enjoy surgery. So the surgery has to be performed. So the intra intracranial uh, surgery has to be performed as well. The patient has to be the the cranial of the patient has to be drilled a little bit, put some kind of a syringe hole, and then the viral need to be injected, guided by the MR, uh, MRI. So the virus can be uh, released to the brain of the patients, which we also think that it's also not that really applicable. That's why we are still in the phase one, two clinical trial. We're still assessing a different kind of uh, route of our administrations. But yeah, but that's, uh, that's a life of a drug development. Yeah, sometimes there is always a development of, I mean, we, we, um, we do it for the first time. So there are so many things that we also have to learn. <clears throat> Yeah, I had a question too. Okay, yeah, so um, 
If I can summarize, uh, so um, the viral vector would only infect a certain cell that depends on its uh, serotype, or we could also um, like localize the infection via um, a certain uh, route of administration. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have another uh, question. Um, this one is from uh, El Sabda. Is there any specific restriction or prohibition of gene incorporation into adeno-associated virus and uh, baculoviruses? If not, then can we use this virus as a universal gene therapy uh, delivery yeah. system? Well, there are, there are some restrictions like um, the AV can, they are like really molecular restrictions. So it's not like a restriction for the virus itself per se, but it's more like um, we, uh, for the AV gene therapy, we cannot really pack uh, large size uh, genes. Like anything that is larger than 4 KB, it would be a problem to, to be packed because uh, the genome, the natural genome size of AAV is only 4.7. So anything that is larger than 4.7 kilobase per won't be packed into the AAV viral factor. And then the second thing is, um, uh, um, the, uh, the viral vector is because it's the nature of a dependo virus, this virus is not going to repl replicate in your body. So if you already get traded, so, the, any kind of cells that you get infected by this virus, uh, this um, it will create a concatenar, or we call it episomal DNA. So the, so the DNA is there, but it's not integrating into your chromosome, so it won't pass down into in, in, into the sister cells. So, <clears throat> or, uh, or sorry, into the daughter cell or the pyrogeny cells. So it won't it won't be passed down. So that's why. So, for example, like if the hepatocyte, one hepatocyte got infected, this, uh, the, the, daughter cell, the daughter cell won't bring this AV gene therapy. So that's why, uh, that's the limitation of this therapy. Um, if you give it to a very early age uh, uh, target cells or target organ that are still um, proliferating because the therapy won't be carried down into the pyrogenous cells. That would be the natural limitation of the AV itself. And the second thing is like, if you use a bacula virus, I think in bacula virus, there is no restrictions. It's just a matter of, um, it's, not, it's not very common for people to use bacula virus to produce anything nowadays. Uh, there are only a few limited, limited products using bacula virus production system. Like for example, like <clears throat> to produce vaccine, for example, uh, like Sanofi platform, or they produce a vaccine called flu block. They use a uh, bacula virus uh, platform to produce this recombinant protein as well. And also they use, um, I think, Gardasil as well. It's also being produced using a bacula virus platform, which is a vaccine against HPV. And then, yeah, I think it's the limitation is only like the knowledge. People are not accustomed to using a bacula virus. But more and more, because it's so versatile, more and more are really, you know, people are really intrigued to use bacula viruses to produce recombinant proteins and other different kind of product. But the other limitation would be the uh, post translation or mod modifications or the glycosylations, which is in the insect cell would be kind of different than the normal mammalian cells, especially the human cells. So that would be the limitation. <clears throat> other questions? Uh, I think there is another one. Mm -hmm. From uh, Ed Edward uh, Chiputra, the nature of the Huntington disease is the uh, progressive disease and the system usually detected at uh, age 40 to 50 because it needs time for the misfolding protein to be accumulated. So the question, um, if the therapy only silence uh, partially HDT gene expression, does it mean that the gene therapy only inhibit the progression but not uh, curative, for example, from yes. age 40, 50 to um, 60, yes. 70. Uh, that's exactly the answer. So basically, um, uh, that's why we cannot treat patients that already showing symptoms because it's already too late. So we can stall the progressions, but if the patient is already having seizures or having like Parkinson-like uh, manifestations, this patient won't enjoy the benefit. This patient will still, you know, we're still having this disease. So we need to treat the patient who already been diagnosed 
the, for certain, for sure, is these patients uh, has uh, you know has a um, in the gene that they, they, they have this kind of uh, mutations and they they have a historical uh, uh, data set as well that their parent having Huntington and then, so uh, this kind of patient population and high risk populations is basically the, the the real market for this AV gene therapy against Huntington so we need to give the therapy to the uh, let's say the childrens that uh, the, that we already diagnosed that they, for sure that these patients carry these mutations and you need to prevent it as soon as possible so they can enjoy uh, the therapy as long as they they live without showing any symptoms but if the symptoms are already there it's already too late so it's kind of like a vaccine against the Huntington so technically speaking the patients won't really see, won't really be able to re really see the benefit. But if uh, historically they already saw the devastating results of the Huntington, they would be really willing to take this therapy, which is it does, it, it does like, like it does act like that. That's why our clinical therapy is, um, I mean, it's not easy, it's, it's, it's not difficult to enroll a patients because the patients are basically really devastated by this disease they, they they witness their parents or their grandparents succumb by this disease so they don't really want that kind of uh, the same of manifestation occurs to them so they really are they are really willing to take the clinical trials <coughs> uh, next in next question there's uh, from Nathaniel Alvin Sanjaya so what do you think regarding the feature of this AAV gene uh, therapy for multifactorial diseases such as a cancer and also uh, metabolic disease. Do you think it's possible to uh, apply gene therapy to treat um, this kind of diseases? And what kind of modification that you think need to be um, added to address um, these uh, multifactorial diseases? Yeah, sure. We are actually trying to go to that directions right now. We wanted to go, not cancer per se, because cancer, <clears throat> yeah, we, we won't be able to use AAV against because of it's not being passed down into the empyrogeny cells. So because cancer is a high, uh, is a fastly dividing cells. So technically AAV, episomal, the episomal um, AAV would basically easily diluted by the, by the cancers. So we won't be able to really target cancer, but other metabolism disease, we, we, we go into like, for example, like Fabry disease, like the lysosomal related disease. We have another programs against um, San Filippo, for example, is also a metabolism disease. Um, uh, together with BMS, for example, uh, we have a program against uh, cardiac, cardiac related disease um, so it's more like for a cardiovascular um, target and yeah I mean but the problem is right now this technology is very very in the early stage in, in terms of applications so uh, uh, in order to be able to really treat a significant amount of patients it takes uh, a lot of adjustments so the best thing is like really to upgrade the technology and really target the market where there is a niche for this therapy for sure. Like cancer or other metabolism disease, like a significant uh, like um, cholesterol related disease, there is already like small compounds and other protein replacement therapy. So we don't really want to go to the, the area where it's already pretty much crowded and there is uh, another therapy and relatively significantly cheaper therapy. So the, the niche for the AV gene therapy is for sure, it's for rare diseases. And for and I think it's a perfect niche in order to really uh, you know um, upgrade the technology first, and then after the technology has become really uh, advanced and and we we, we kind of understand the know how for really going for large indications and uh, for sure we we are going to we are going toward that indications as well. <clears throat> So uh, again, I would like to um, invite a question from the um, audience. Perhaps someone would like to uh, ask um, directly instead of using um, chat box. I, I think they're slipping, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so um, I would like um, to know because um, at this point, um, gene therapy is still um, really, really um, expensive. You know, how many years ahead that these uh, ther therapy would be um, affordable? So uh, I'm, I can imagine it's sort of um, like um, full genome yeah. sequencing, like. It started like from millions of dollars, but now it's only, I think it, it's only like still, you know, yeah. 100,000, which yeah, is still, you know, payable. Yeah, I think, I think it's, um, it's, it's the same questions like the first time when people isolated a monoclonal antibodies, which is roughly around 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, when the first time, when, you know, first and uh, monoclonal antibody is being used for I think he was one of the founder of my company as well. He, uh, it's not, it's even more than 20 years ago for rheumatoid arthritis, if I'm not mistaken. I, I don't really remember. So it was like a long time ago when the first time people discovered antibody, it was, it was very expensive as well. It's still, it's still really expensive nowadays, but it's relatively cheaper. And uh, because we already getting to know what would be the best platform to produce this kind of novel biologicals what would be the criteria? And for example, what we are facing in the field is not only us who relatively new to this therapy, but also the, regula the regulatory bodies. So whenever we file an applications for, uh, you know, um, for clinical trial, whatever it is, we're not only educating ourselves, but we're also educating our regulatory bodies. For example, here in Europe, we have a close contact with EMA, European Medical Agency. In the U.S., we are also having a close contact with the FDA. So people and people are, you know, like really because they also don't know that, well, this kind of therapy. The same questions like 30 years ago against the antibodies. So I think it takes roughly around 10 or 20 years. Uh, I think for this one, it can be a little bit faster because of the, the other technology is already advanced so so far as well. So I think. Um, it takes another 10 years so it becomes very like you know very relatively cheaper but it's getting there you know? it's it's like every mission of a vegan therapy company is to make the production or the cost of goods cheaper that's like every mission of every a vegan therapy company mm. um, in terms of um government uh support uh, for example, in in Netherlands, is there a uh, like special uh, support that the government um, give in order um, to increase the development of gene therapy, or perhaps in um, other countries? Well, uh, it's like it's like a normal support, like research funding or tax rabbit and you know, tax discount. Uh, but I think. I think what makes it really different is the the, cult, the, the, the the culture in the society where everybody here, like in the U.S. also, like um, it's, uh, especially the industry culture is a research-driven industry. So everything, we, we don't want to be, we don't want to create a Me Too product, but we want to be the first. We want to create a... Uh, we're groundbreaking a breakthrough products and that's kind of like a cultural uh, behaviors and also mentality and that drives this kind of like you know um, breakthrough companies appearing in yearly basis so AV gene therapy is actually in terms of um, existence is relatively older nowadays they are like for example novel technologies companies like people use CRISPR base for example and <clears throat> and people are always is a society that is being driven by it's not the society the industry itself is being driven by technology advancement so and really increase the added values based on the IPs and the knowledge not based on the volume not based on you know the raw material base, um, uh, which is the main mentality, still residing in mostly in the developing countries. So it's that's that's what kind of like you know make it different in the Netherlands compared and also in the U.S. In the U.S. is also the same, but 
it's a totally different culture. There is more like, you know, the investor are investing so much money into the field that they think it can be the next pack, the next Google or the next uh, Genetech, the next Kilia, for example. So they are looking for the next best technology. So <clears throat> in, the gov in, in the Netherlands, I think it's the government supported the kind of creativity in the US, the investor supporting that kind of crea creativities. I hope that answers your questions. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, most of our uh, participants are um, students and uh, perhaps you can uh, share your um, experience. Um, how does it feel, you know, working in um, research-based uh, company like compared to research institution, institution or at uh, doing research at university? Sorry, can you repeat Oh, yeah. So, because uh, uh, most of um, the participants are student, uh, perhaps you can uh, share um, your uh, experience. Uh, how does it uh, feel like working in research-based uh, companies um, in unique cure uh, compared with a uh, research um, institute or at a uh, university? Uh, I think, yeah, it's also a journey that I had to like, you know, take. Like, for example, I, I was, I was really came from academic culture and then I, after I finished my PhD I wanted to go um, even, actually I wanted to pursue academic career but then um, I start observing a lot of um, I would say it's an ideal world like uh, in academic field like, um, so I, I wanted to go into like a really transitional you know, applied where I where my knowledge really wants to like it re really matters and then so uh, that's that's the moment that I okay I decided to go to in the industry and then it was not that really easy anyway you know, to find to find a, um, a research post in a, in the Europe because you have to compete with tons of European talents and then <clears throat> um, yeah I mean well the difference is in the industry is um, the people are more to the point so we really want to get things done and that kind of mentality is is kind of different than in academia where um where i used to be where you know i, I mean as, as soon as i publish a paper i'm done okay the project is done uh, okay i don't need to do anything about it anymore so um, or it's my professor's problem or i mean i don't really care the continuation of these stories I don't really need to care that I created some kind of product or something like that with using my with using my time or my study. Um, yeah, so in industry, we are being forced to get things done. Like for example, I'm in charge for various different project right now, and then the company already invested a lot of money in that kind of project, and they want to really see the project end. If there are only two ways they can accept the results: whether the project fail or the project success. And it's, as long as you reach that point, it's fine. Whether it's failure, it's fine. But as long as you already show, you already done the marks, and it's failed, it's failed. But that's what I kind of like, because you and I, it's really like trigger the people to really put their best. And then I think uh, in the Netherlands, it's uh, the the culture is very open and also very. People are supporting each other and I work with tons of multinational colleagues like um, I have a French technicians, German scientists um, in, in a group full of Dutch and then uh, I think uh, we have people from various different countries in Lexington as well uh, so it's it's a very interesting atmosphere you debate and then you you try to sell your ideas uh, to the people that have a different perceptions of uh, different cultures and different ideas. There are Americans who are very straightforward, uh, straightforward and the Dutch is also straightforward, but a little bit less, um, uh, you know, really a little bit less daring compared to the Americans. So I learned a lot. It's, 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 it's a very interesting uh, atmosphere that you cannot really get it in the, in, in, the industry, in the academia where people are, you know, uh, limited by time and then the, the, the proposal of your academia is kind of different, you know. 
you just publish paper on courage. And here, you really want to bring the therapy to the patients, and you really want to get the project done. So yeah, it's it's very interesting for me. Mm, okay, um, thank you. Uh, so, uh, is there any uh, more question from um, the audience? Anyone? I don't think so. <laughs> no. Okay. Um. Um. If um not, I will um close um the uh, power talk. Uh, perhaps we can um share um the link so all of the uh participant um can um scan the link to give uh, feedback so we can have a, a better uh, session uh, for the uh, next uh, power talk. And for um, those who had a problem with the uh, connection, uh, we are recording um, the session and uh, perhaps it will be um, shared uh, via email. Okay, so um, that's conclude our um, event. Um, again, I would like to uh, thank uh, Anga for uh, the insightful uh, talk. And I would also uh, like to thank uh, all of the uh, participants and uh, attendees. And I'm uh, looking forward to see uh, all of you in our um, next uh, event. So uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Anga. Uh, stay safe, yeah. everyone. Um, have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Terima kasih. Nah, ini untuk sesi berikutnya ya, bulan depan untuk functional food. Semoga semua sudah mengcopy uh, link evaluasinya ya. Sampai bertemu bulan depan. Bye bye. Thank you, Jojo, Kanya, Mary. Terima kasih, Bu. Bye-bye. Terima kasih juga, Bu Siti. Bye. -bye.